Well, good morning. Um, this is our Bible study time, and uh, we're going to open up with a, a word of prayer. Gracious God, be with us today. Um, thank you for this beautiful gospel of Mark, and enlighten us this morning uh, with your word. In your name we pray. Amen. We are continuing our Bible study. We are in the middle of uh, chapter 10, and hopefully we'll get through uh, chapter 11 uh, today. But we are starting on verse 17 of uh, the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel. This is the encounter with the rich man. And so the reading begins. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt before Jesus, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. And you shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the rich man heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. This Just stopping here, it's right at uh, verse 22. <clears throat> a couple of things that come out of this. Um, i am uh, been reading a little bit from uh, my professor from seminary, uh, Don Jewell, uh, spoke about this whole thing about um, good teacher and... It seems like the in Mark um, that the idea of giving good order, uh, Jesus reminds him that no one is good but God alone. And it, what Dr. Jewell was saying is that uh, Jesus seems to be aware of the fact that he is in, uh, in his humanity, is still in a subordinate role to the Father. And so he... He keeps that uh, that that um, that role of subordinate uh, under the Father. Um, we hear this: "Not my will, but Thine be done." Uh, Jesus on the cross again reiterates, "Not what I want, but what You want, Father." So there is there is the need for that. The other thing that comes up is that uh, this rich man. We don't know how he got his wealth, but in talking to other, uh, reading other commentaries, um, it seems like wealth was acquired by fraud. And so one of the reasons that um, Jesus tells him, you've done all the commandments. He doesn't, he, he lays out the basic commandments and this man says, I've observed them. But um, it seems like to sell his possessions, to give back whom he's defrauded in acquiring this wealth. So there has been uh, this idea is that if you were wealthy, that was considered a blessing from God. In other words, um, acquiring wealth was an indication that God was blessing you. And Jesus is um, kind of reversing that idea that all wealth comes uh, from God blessing. Um, and he's uplifting that to the young man. No, you have defrauded people, so you need to return that. Um, wealth itself is not necessarily a bad thing. How one uses it to enhance the life of the community, I think, is part of where Jesus is going with that. Let's continue with verse 22. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. What happens with wealth is sometimes that becomes the objective, not how you can use it to better the community, but the wealth itself. So wealth by itself is not a problem, but the fact that it dominates our lives and controls our lives, then that becomes the issue. So how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. And they're perplexed because... They've always assumed the system of belief was that if you were wealthy, it's because God has blessed you. But Jesus said to them, again, 
children how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who has, that is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? In other words, if it's not because God blesses you, then, you know, what's happening, you know? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. I'm intrigued by another little statement, and this came out in our Bible study last night. And that is that Jesus keeps lifting up children and said, to them belongs the kingdom of God. If you do not enter the kingdom of God like a child, you can't enter it. What's interesting is that in spite of their buffoonery, in spite of the fact that they don't seem to get it, Jesus still calls them children, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. So <clears throat> even though their faith is misguided, even though they don't quite understand this new um, dynamic, this uh, paradigm shift of not wealth isn't the, the means of God's grace, uh, um, and that we need to take care of each other, the focus is no longer on getting ahead, but what should happen to the community and take care of the community, um, Jesus still calls them his children. And I, I think that is a wonderful, wonderful addition to the text. He could have just called them his disciples, you know. He could have just said, well, how hard it is, you know. But no, he calls them children. I think that's that's good. He's including them in the kingdom, even though they don't understand even though their faith is misguided, even though they've made mistakes. Then uh, verse uh, 28, Peter began to say to him, look, we have left everything and to follow you. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, which is very interesting. In other words, blessing is here as well it's not some pie in the sky but there's already blessings both by doing the commandments and by living out uh, this life of relationship houses brothers sisters mother and children and fields with persecutions and the age to come eternal life but many who are first will be last and the last will be first again reminding people that getting ahead um is not necessarily about acquiring wealth. Getting ahead is about relationships, brothers, sisters, and all that stuff. Yes, and fields, and possessions. But those come with persecutions. Uh, verse 32, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. He took the 12 aside again and began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes. They will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. Again, Jesus is uh, foreshadowing, uh, telling the, what's going to happen to him. He's laying out clearly. He's speaking uh, openly about what's going to happen. Um, this happens. And immediately following that, uh, we hear the next text, which is this request that James and John make. So James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever you, we ask of you. Jesus said to them, What is it that you ask that me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but for those to whom it has been prepared. Again, uh, <clears throat> there's the subordination, subor uh, subordinating himself 
that the Father is the one who decides who's going to be sitting at the right hand and the left hand. Jesus is, says, I, that's not mine to decide. Um, this continual reminder that God has a plan and Jesus is an instrument of that plan. And so Jesus is living out the servanthood that he calls them to live out in deep subordination, even unto death. In baptism, <clears throat> death is seen as a baptism into death, as resurrection will be understood also as a baptism into resurrection. Um, and so, you know, he is inviting them. Um, the other interesting thing is the idea of the cup. I'd be able to drink from the cup. This gets repeated. This word cup gets repeated again. Father, if you can have this cup pass for me, but not my will, but thine be done. Um, there, there is some um, allusion to some of the predictions about Messiah from the Old Testament that are included in this. And so these themes have a history to them. The words have a history to them, often going back many, many years, hundreds of years. And uh, now they are being uh, somehow inaugurated and, and seen. They're coming to life in uh, these uh, texts. Verse 41. I know you can imagine. You know, after James and John, who just, just got done, just got telling them, you know, hey, you know what following me looks like? It's it's death, okay? Are you able to do that? Are you able to? Oh, sure. No problem. We can do that. Um, little do they know. I don't, Again, Jesus doesn't, he says, you don't know what you're talking about. You think it's some some glorious something that in glory, in your glory, is somehow some conquering ruler. Uh, you're thinking, again, in earthly terms. Uh, maybe it's not Peter this time, but James and John obviously have the same blindness <laughs> that Peter had. Then verse 41, when the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. You think? So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, lord it over them. Um, the word lord, um, there is a dynamic to that. Um, and their great ones are tyrants over them. Uh, the word have, have roots in the word power, dynamis, uh, which is mean they don't care. They're overpowering you. They're I don't know if you can say dynamiting over you or however you want to say that. But uh, so this idea of power makes right. Power where is where glory is at versus servanthood. These are themes that they're not catching on. They're, they're, not, they're not being aware of or they're just denying it. You know, it's like, come on, how long? Right. Then verse 43. But it is not so among you. Whatever Jesus is inaugurating, whatever uh, paradigm he is shifting here, the shift is all of those themes and all those things that you learn from your from your youth and all the things that have been a part of the, the cultic uh, belief of the time, that's not where we're going. This is not the way we're going to do it. It is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be the first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I love the ending. That kind of like, wow, they should get it now. <clears throat> What's really cool is the next uh, section, the end of uh, chapter 10 here. We're on verse, verse 46. So they came to Jericho. And Jericho is just a, a little city right above Jerusalem, a little bit, maybe uh, eight miles away or something like that. And they came to Jerusalem. So Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. I want to say something about this. Uh, this is, again, from uh, Dr. Don Jewell. Uh, what happens here is that the Gospel of Mark up until the chapter 10 here, the end of chapter 10. Uh, time is, you know, there's maybe uh, three years talking about Jesus' ministry. Not real specific about time or space or where they are. But as you get into uh, chapter 11, all of a sudden, 
Mark shifts and his writing becomes, he starts telling them exactly their, you know, um, their, uh, well, in fact, the first verses in, in chapter 11, when they had a, were approaching Jerusalem, so he starts saying exactly where they are, at Bethage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives. I mean, he's giving all of these geographic details. Um, and then time also, it was noon, or it was uh, the ninth hour, or it was during the Passover, or it was during the festival of, of leavened bread. All of these specific things now start emerging in and getting introduced into the text. It becomes more historical so that it can be verified and it can be seen and it can be um, uh, verified from other sources. So, but we're still in chapter 10. I want to get this last little story. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Again, the designation son of David becomes important. Uh, Bartimaeus is recognizing Jesus for who he is. Um, many sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he cried out even, even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well immediately regained his sight and followed him on the way. Here's the thing about that, and that is that Bartimaeus is blind, but sees. He knows who Jesus is. The disciples are seeing, but are blind to who Jesus is and what he's inviting them into. Um, I Again, I think that's important. The other thing is about the healing, and one of the things that was brought up in one of the commentaries is that Jesus does not uh, apply some ointment. He does not touch Bartimaeus. He just speaks the word, and Bartimaeus is healed. It lifts up the power of the word. And uh, <clears throat> I think this is, this is how the good news works. The good news is good uh, news because we hear it, and it is truth, and it has the power to do things. This is, again, the power of creation. And God said, let there be light, and light happens. And God said to Bartimaeus, go. Uh, your faith has made you well, and it happens. Healing takes place. Uh, the power of the word becomes lifted up in this story. So we're going to go on to chapter 11. So I encourage you to... Um, um, check out uh, in your Bibles, beginning with verse 1. So like I said, when they were approaching Jerusalem, Jesus' ministry now starts focusing on Jerusalem. He starts uh, healing less and uh, starts focusing on what he has to do in Jerusalem. When they approached Jerusalem at Bethsage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you. And immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found the colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them, what Jesus had said, and they allowed him to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The very words our ancestor David that Bartimaeus is saying, they are repeating, but they have two different ideas about what that means. 
Uh, so now again, um, there is the 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 old uh, prediction of one of the ancestors of David who will come and free them, and they're assuming by freedom, they are assuming this person will vanquish them from their foes and from those who oppress them. Uh, that's not necessarily the mode or the intent of the Messiah. And Jesus is redefining what Messiah will be and what that will mean. And they are kind of hard to pick up on that. And the very ones who call Hosanna with the idea that this is an earthly king will turn around and cry out, crucify him. We don't know him. Uh, he's not the legitimate uh, king. He's not the legitimate Messiah. So then he entered Jerusalem. So Jesus comes from Jericho, meets Bartimaeus, and you know the, that all of that. Um, and they went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went on to Bethany. Uh, just a reminder and a little interruption here at this time. Uh, but getting back to the Bible study, uh, let's pick it up on, on verse 12 of chapter 11. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, Jesus was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Uh, verse 15, Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the many money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. There's a combination uh, happening here. Uh, there's there's many questions about the fig tree and the cursing of the fig tree. It seems so out of character for Jesus. But um, again, <clears throat> It is important to listen to what is taking place. One of the things that happens here is immediately following the cursing of the fig tree is this uh, cleansing of the temple. Um, again, commentators uh, are divided on what exactly this means. I take them together. In other words, they're two separate things, but they are feeding and explaining a little bit. And I think the... Uh, the fig tree is maybe um, a suggestion that the temple itself has become a place where there's all kinds of beautiful leaves on it. There's all kinds of good stuff happening. But at the same time, there's nothing substantial for the people to feed on. In other words, the word is not strengthening them. Whatever's happening in the temple is not something that is edible anymore. It just looks good. And the cursing of the temple may be even allusion to the fact that Jesus um, says the temple is going to be destroyed. And, and in fact, that is what happens. <laughs> and the writing is actually happening right about the time that this takes place uh, of Mark's gospel. But uh, this whole idea that it becomes uh, a whitewashed place, but inside it's corrupt. Now, many probably may make a lot of the idea that uh, the cleansing of the temple was this vicious thing, whatever. Uh, Dr. Jewell said he doesn't believe that's probably the case, because if that were the case during that time, this is right before the Passover, and um, there were plenty of army forces that were there to protect from an uprise, which was common uh, during that time. Uh, the Jewish people are a, a, a monotheistic people. They believe in one God. 
most of the religions around there were polytheistic and believed in many gods. And the the amount of animosity and, and um, zealous uh, uh, feelings towards their faith caused sometimes these itinerant uh, 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 messiah types to rise up and call to arms and have people, you know, doing whatever. So if that were the case, the army forces would have come in because that was their that was their charge. And and uh, Pilate was very concerned about that. He was kind of a puppet a leader anyway. And so he would be a, afraid that Rome would come down and remove him or more importantly, probably kill him and then remove him uh, to keep order, to not let things get out of hand. That doesn't happen. The other thing is, if if Jesus had wanted to, he probably could have called his disciples, which, of course, he doesn't, in which case, not only would Jesus have been um, killed by the Roman soldiers, but so would have uh, his disciples. Again, that also doesn't happen. So Don Jewell said this is probably not as big a controversy as it's been made out at times uh, to be, but I think the cleansing of the temple and the fig tree have some have some connection. Which kind of brings us then to the next verses, uh, verse 20. So then, after the cleansing of the temple and, uh, or, you know, whatever, uh, the disciples and Jesus leave uh, Jerusalem and go out of the city. But in the morning, they come back. In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Then Peter, remembering and remembered and said to, to uh, him, Rabbi, look. The fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea. And if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you uh, ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Whenever you stand praying, Forgive if you have anything against uh, anyone, so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Jesus is saying a lot about what he believes the uh, the office that the temple holds, and it's supposed to be a house of prayer. And he doesn't see that. I'm not saying that the money changers aren't to be there, because... The temple was still the center of, of civic life as well as religious life. And so people would be coming, Jews would be coming from different countries. They would be coming with their currencies, right, uh, from Africa or whatever. And they would have to go someplace to make exchange of that. And this is exactly what took place in the temple. It might have been on, a, on an annex of some, play, of some sort. But Jesus wanted to lift up the idea that the primary focus of the temple was to be a place of worship and prayer. And so the other thing then is he's also saying, you don't need to go um, and through the temple in order to be heard by God. That is the place where you do that, the location, but God is with you all the time. And so if you are praying and, and you say, um, you know, have this mountain be moved, it will happen. Uh, God is listening. And he feels that all these other things are becoming a distraction. And that God, not that God isn't listening, but that somehow they uh, get in the way of uh, true worship and an authentic prayer. Jesus' authority is questioned. Now, verse 27. Again, they came to Jerusalem. So they've come through, they passed by the fig tree once again. Now they're coming into Jerusalem. They've gone out um, in the evening. Now they're coming back. They came into Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and scribes and the elders came to him and said, by what authority are you doing these things? So must, they must have caught up now. The news has gotten out. And now they found out that she has been including the tables and, and making these predictions. Who do you, who, who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus so said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? Answer me. They argued with one another, 
if we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe in John? But shall we say of human origin, they would be afraid of the crown, for all regarded John as truly a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. I think this begins the cat and mouse stuff with Jesus and the temple authorities. There is a, an ongoing little bantering back and forth. They are counting on authority that comes from tradition. And Jesus is counting on a different authority. And they are afraid to confront that because Jesus has evidence on his side that he is from God. And they're not sure that they can somehow push against that with tradition alone. And part of that is because people follow uh, authentic stuff. They follow truth. And pretty soon uh, tradition will not hold up over against truth. Uh, even tradition is subject to the truth. Jesus knows that. And so do they. Um, and there's power in the crowds. Uh, I love this. One of my favorite movies um, um, is Russell Crowe, The Gladiator. Now, I, I enjoy that movie mostly because it's an old movie and, and I love the uh, the his, historical aspect of it. But uh, here's this, you know, Roman army general who was next in line, you know, going to be uh, given power. And it's stripped away from him. He is, um, um, is banished. I thought he was going to kill him. But he has power because he appeals to the crowd the strength, the power of public opinion and how how that is wielded uh, in uh, that movie. And then also it is wielded here in the story. And it will become even more so as the story progresses. And we're going to see that. Um, without the crowd, uh, the crucifixion may not have taken place. But the crowd becomes not only those who you know, praise uh, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But now they can also turn, and they do. Um, and that becomes a powerful force in this story. Let us close in prayer. Uh, there are so much more here, I know, and I encourage you to read the commentaries. And uh, so if you want to pick up uh, a commentary and if you have questions and bring them back to me, I'd be very happy to answer them as best I can. But let us close in prayer. Gracious God, thank you for uh, this time uh, this morning. Be with us as we continue uh, to search this gospel and to learn more about it. Um, keep us safe this day. Uh, bless our comings and our goings and uh, watch over us. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.